just want to say thank you to begin with, uh, while the kid was getting all in. Oh, you're there. Well done. Uh, say thank you for the AGM. That was great. I am re-elected as an elder. I wasn't going to stand again. Uh, I was going to leave it the wrong and wrong. <laughs> That's big of me, isn't it? Thank you. But uh, I think it's going to be a great year ahead with the uh, new system we've got in place. It's probably just moving the furniture sideways a little bit, but at least it takes a little bit of uh, weight off our shoulders. And so I'm looking forward to seeing it working. And so all the nuts and bolts of running this church are on your head now, folks. Uh, well, the committee of how many? Six people? Chibi, you're one of them. Seven. Yeah. Look out, we're going to blame you for everything now. <laughs> no, no, it's a great church to work with, and I think we can, and as a team, we can all uh, achieve a lot for the Lord. Mm. Yeah, well, what do you preach about when you stand before the pulpit? I guess when you're preaching two sermons on a Sunday, and then, uh, well, yeah, one on a Sunday morning, one on a Sunday night, and a Bible study in the middle of the week, working 80 hours, as I did in Burwood, uh, it's pretty easy. You have a system and you work through it, but uh, when you're only up here once a month or so, what do you preach about? Well, I've been looking at uh, Genesis 15, and I haven't even finished the first verse yet. I've already spent three sermons on it, and I was going to be talking about that again today. But a few things have happened in my uh, circumstances, my comings and goings, that I thought I might share with you today. People I've met, things that I've seen, things that I've done. So I'm going to ask the question, what is truth? And in any case, is it important? Well, we'll explore that in, in a moment or two. I haven't turned this on yet, Kim, so I'll see if I can run the show from here. Let's see if I can. Oh, I can. So this was something that I probably should have shared at the prayer time, Ron, earlier. Uh, I've got an email during the week. It would be Meek's prayer letter, but I haven't even read the Meek's prayer letter. There was a covering email about uh, this American family. I was going to say a couple. Uh, Clay is a fellow worker with uh, with Tom, Tom Meeks, and the maintenance industry up there with MAF in New Guinea. Their son has been, well, was sent to Brisbane for tests, and it's it's apparent now that he's got leukemia and has to go back to the United States for treatment. So uh, AMAF is asking for prayer for that family and for those who are left behind. Of course, we might pray now. Let's do that. And on behalf of us here at Living the Hope, Lord, we bow before you at this time with a need that you know all about even before we begin to ask. It's been apparent for the last week or so You've allowed this to happen in this fallen, corrupt world, and uh, we can trust you to uh, put it all together in the way that you see fit. We pray for Tom and Gemma and the family. We pray for Clay, his wife, and, uh, and two children, including Brian with the leukemia. And we pray that all things will indeed work out for good for them because they love you and they are for all intents and purposes, apparently all according to your purposes. Look after them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So keep Tom and Gemma and that this family in, not well that is Tom and Gemma, but this family, uh, Clay and his wife, uh, whose name I don't know, and their children. Uh, now just an advertisement. Tomorrow night is the midnight for the screening of the movie Indivisible. Not invisible, but indivisible. It's about an American chaplain, army chaplain, who's newly married, posted to a, an army base and then sent off to Iraq for an indeterminate period of time. And it talks about the struggle in their marriage and their relationship, uh, both him and her, and it is quite a true story, apparently. So that's tomorrow night at the event cinema. So I've got tickets, still got some left. So if you'd like to see me afterwards, I'll set you up with, uh, with your tickets. It'll help support 
chaplaincy, but more than that, I think most of our funds these days are going to RI teaching in, uh, in our schools. Moving away, it's harder and harder to get volunteer teachers, but university students, for instance, who are young anyway, uh, are finding this a, a good opportunity to earn a little bit of money, and uh, they have the time available. So if you'll support a worthy cause. Send me about tickets afterwards. Let's see, I should be holding this because I want to hurry on to this next one. Dr. Alan Meyer may be familiar with some of you. He's been big in Australian Evangelical Christianity for a few years now. 26 years, the pastor of the Church of Christ in Victoria. But uh, Connect Church over on Hickey Road, having, uh, having him come to talk to the men, barbecue next Friday night. So well, I think there's some blurbs out on the table there, the morning tea table. You can uh, see about that because you have to let them know if you're going to be going. Let them know by Wednesday, I think. Okay? All right, that question about truth. What, what is it? And is it important? Uh, I go down to Orderly every Thursday, most Thursdays anyway and that help out a mate of mine, his name is Daniel Scott and his wife Marriott, they're both from Pakistan they had to leave on threat of death or at least he did about 1989 or something like that and uh, in recent years, the last 20 years, he's been exposing Islam writing about it, preaching about it, teaching about it and writing books about it, and I've been helping him uh, with his book writing. They put out a regular newsletter, and uh, Marriott quite often asked me to make a contribution. So uh, I wrote a brief paragraph, not realizing that Daniel's article was going to be about the authenticity of the Bible and how we can indeed trust the scripture to be a true record that uh, does indeed point us to a living God. So he may wrote quite a good article, and I uh, actually just had this as a footnote then, this paragraph, and I just want to read it to you. Well, you can already read it from back there. So let's ask the question, what is truth? It's a question most people don't even bother to ask, let alone investigate. Born into a secular Australian community, most consider that that is normal and uh, they just go along with it, don't they? Your brothers and sisters, your sons and daughters, probably many of them, and your parents too, born as Australians and uh, very much secularist. Uh, then there are those who do go to church, but don't take the time to check out the Christian faith in any serious study of scripture. Get along to Ron's Bible study tomorrow, folks, or ours on Wednesday night this week and uh, really seriously consider the Word of God, the authentic message from God. Let's not neglect it. Yes, there are those who do go to church, but couldn't tell you, couldn't witness to a, a non-Christian neighbor about why they should become Christian. Sad. And then there are those, because it was the Muslim context in which I was writing, there are those raised in that should be S-I-C alongside that O-N there, shouldn't it? It should be in a, a Muslim community and therefore don't dare to question its credentials. Uh, Muslims who have questioned, have brought their questions to the mosque have been severely punished, lashes and so forth, physically punished for uh, daring to ask a question about the Quran. So, when you think about it, all three of these positions are actually prisons, are they not? Prisons for the soul. They bind us, bind people into that groove. Well, of course, there is a sense in which those who know the truth of Scripture are in a prison as well. That's why Paul would talk about himself being a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ, bound to that body of truth. Well, that's the body of truth that I want to be a slave to, imprisoned by. Uh, wouldn't you agree that that is the, uh, the only prison worth uh, uh, finding yourself in? 
We are called to know the truth, that's for sure. We must know the truth. Have you, do you recognize that face? If you read the text that I've put alongside it, you'll see that that is Fraser Hanning. Uh, I mentioned that I work with Daniel Scott at Ibrahim Ministries at Alderley. Uh, well, I, on Tuesday he was coming to see Daniel, Fraser Hanning was, and his wife, because years ago his wife had been to a seminar that Daniel had spoken about. And uh, she knew that Fraser would be uh, helped in his understanding of uh, Australian society by getting a word in Daniel's ear uh, about the real truth about Muslims and Islam in Australia. Because, you know, he's famous now, isn't he, for that uh, speech where he talks about uh, restricting immigration, calling it the final solution. Well, it was Hitler the only one who was allowed to use that. Uh, maybe that is. I, I think in Japan, Muslims are not allowed to enter the country. Uh, is that still the case, Jimmy? Uh, I wonder, anyway, we, the horse has bolted, we're back here, we must accommodate them, and we must see that they are law-abiding citizens. But they are in a prison of their own. Uh, they're in a mindset, a worldview uh, of their own, and they're... Uh, their purpose in life, if they're serious about their Islam, is to see that the rest of the world uh, submits to its authority. So we've got a battle on our hands about what is truth. And it is a fight, it is a battle. We have to fight it tooth and nail. Well, uh, I've got a few questions there, a few comments. Uh, yes, Fraser Anning is on the right side of politics, with a capital R, you know right meaning correct. Well, I think he is anyway, but that's a personal opinion. Uh, as a conservative, uh, I would consider him to be on the right, the political right. If you were on the, on the left of politics, you would put him on the far right, maybe extreme right, and you would ridicule him as such for being there. And he does get plenty of uh, flack, doesn't he? Much like Donald Trump does in the United States. This is getting very political now, isn't it? But uh, there is a very good reason for that because it all impinges on this question of truth and freedom to believe. And I would suggest that if the further left you go in politics and political persuasion, the more anti-Christian you are likely to be. I would hope that uh, Christianity stands somewhere in the middle uh, although, don't quote me on that, I'm not quite sure. Maybe we further right than we would like to believe. Uh, but uh, how far left or right, as long as it's belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the bottom line, isn't it? Anyway, regardless of, uh, of our uh, opinions of right and left politics, which side of politics should we be on as Christians? Might well be a question we ought to ask ourselves. Uh, bearing in mind that uh, if you move to the left, you're going to be uh, moving further and further away from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're hearing that, aren't we? Fraser Anning is a senator in Parliament, and he, said he says he sits in Parliament with a room full of commies. <laughs> That's his, they were his words. He sits in Parliament in a room full of commies. In other words, communists. In other words, far-left politicians, senators. And so you can see which way our Australian politics is going. And, uh, of course, you're going down that track, you're getting further and further into safe schools, getting RI out of schools, getting chaplains out of schools, etc., etc. Well, anyway, even if we do have a left-wing government for the next 10 years, what should our response be as Christians? If we consider them to be far from the truth, then what should our response be? I'm reading two passages of Scripture. Yes, it's good to read the Bible in church, isn't it? And this is our Bible reading for today. You've got a Bible, I trust, with you. Uh, 
if not, just take note of the references. And here is our response. Maybe I should read the, uh, the Peter one first of all. Yes, I'll read Peter. First Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 13. It says this, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God and honor the king. And so it goes on in that vein. I think uh, Paul in Romans, Romans 13, or is it 16? Romans 13, Romans 16. I should have looked it up. Said something about uh, that as well, that we need to submit to the authority of our government even if they are hardliners and uh, retrograde or uh, uh, lacking moral fiber according to our definition of it. What about the Idi Amin's of this world though, or the Hitler's, and uh, the list is pretty long in the 20th century going into the 21st, is it not? Yes, but we, we are called to submit to the authorities as if they've been appointed by God himself. But uh, as I turn to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, I uh, see a bit of a, 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 another slant on it. Love is a key in, uh, in the Peter reading, I guess. Submission and, and love uh, and respect. In chapter 2, it's prayer, uh, among other things. I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for all, for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. I wonder how that applies to North Korea. Oh, yes. I wonder if there are Christians who are able to freely practice their faith there, at least until they're caught with a Bible in the workplace or something. I mean, how do you be a Christian in a country like North Korea? So anyway, we need to pray for our governments, for our people in authority. Pray for them. This is good, it says, and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself the ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. And for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, and a teacher of the true faith to the Gentiles. And you will remember that uh, right at the beginning, at the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, we were all appointed to be witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, the Great Commission in Matthew 28 is like that. We are to make disciples. We are not to be passive followers of the Lord Jesus Christ sitting here in church on Sunday. We are to be actively advocating for our faith. We are to be defending truth. This is our calling. We are called to be witnesses. So I've got some pretty pictures on the screen then. And it's not a diversion, it's not a distraction. I am coming to a point that I'm making here. First of all, you might notice some strange anthills that we met in abundance. But the big ones that look like baby elephants were up Mariba Way, up Mount Garnet Way. And they're huge and uh, strange, but they're everywhere, all over the place. And then from about Julia Creek West, and up to uh, Normanton on the way to Corumba, there's these strange ones that go up and come to a point at the top so that, uh, so that the ball can't sit on it. Now, I don't know why they do that, but they always, uh, those went that way, and up there they went that way, and uh, yeah, at home, Gordon Brook, Kingaroy, they just mount about this high, 
uh, there's all sorts of white ants. So that, let's move on. And then there's that strange looking huge snail. Some of them are as big as a car, but the ones we saw at Richmond were as big as this around. They look like fossilized snails, but in fact they're not, according to the geologists anyway. They start off with a little uh, irregularity and, and the sediments build up on it and of course with water swirling around they take their shape. Uh, a little bit of an anomaly, but they're only really, I don't know whether they're found anywhere else in the world, but certainly around Richmond with uh, an abundance of them. By the way, Fraser Anning's wife's brother is the mayor of Richmond, and he had the lake there, Richmond built, and I don't have a picture of it. Then there's Joan. Can you see Joan with the red hat? That's the Melanda Falls in, uh, on the Atherton Tableland. And uh, then Corumba, where the brolgas are in abundance. You saw them up there, Neville and Joan? Or right, you saw them anywhere, other places, I'm sure, didn't you? Yeah. They were originally called native companions, because they get so tame that, you know, see them They're right there by the caravan park in Corumba itself. Uh, then moving to the right, we get. Uh, We've, we've been converted to Nerida tea because we found the Nerida tea farm there right on the Atherton table and just near Malanga. Malanga. And uh, then down here on the left, I left my wife to go and visit that, uh, that pond there. I went off to Keppel Sands and had a look at the, the nice sandy beach and had a cup of coffee at a pub of all places. I uh, couldn't find a cappuccino anywhere and I went, went walked into a pub and just uh, the, the barman said, oh, you're just in time, I'm just boiling the jug, would you like a and this cafe? <laughs> well, second best is better than none at all. Uh, well, Joan went to a crocodile farm with 4,000 or so uh, uh, in captivity, fortunately. Fortunately. Uh, you can just see the edge of the fence there. The uh, People who were doing the tour with Joan were told not to lean over the fence for obvious reasons. But lo and behold, a couple of a couple of tourists did. They leaned over, over the fence, but anyway, they didn't get eaten. They're still there. Uh, crocodiles. That is a crocodile in the water. In the middle, that's Wangeki Beach. We stopped and took a photo of that three days before that girl was killed on that very beach, just a week or so, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, horrible. And then there's the sun setting. The only place in Queensland that I can think of is the western coast of Cape York, and that's the sun setting at Karamba, a uh, fishing spot. And then that's the Daintree, Daintree River going into the ocean there. We did go to the Daintree, but here, it's a pretty picture. Not very many plants have their flowers on the trunks of trees, but this particular, I think it's a quondong, is it not? I can't remember. They call it a coliflory. And uh, this is just one example of many uh, plaques that you appear all over these national parks. And that one doesn't say it, but most of them said, you know, this uh, site formed 350 million years ago as a result of volcanic lava and so forth, you know, uh, or 270 year, million years and so forth. You see what they're saying, that there is no God, God is not needed. Given enough time, this world can do what it's doing all by itself, which is hogwash, of course. I've just ordered a dozen calendars from uh, British Ministries just got them on my desk and because it was such a large order they sent me a free DVD. Ten reasons why Darwin was wrong and we watched it the other night a Dr. Stanford, uh, a very capable uh, Christian uh, not theologist, I can't remember his field of study, but uh, he ably refuted every one of the evolution's theories but evolutionists put up their story as if it's fact, as if it's proven fact. And so how can you have sedimentary layers of geology of rock 
millions, yeah, each, each layer and millions of years on all, and then all of a sudden you come across a, a picture of or a, a place where there's a, a fossilized giant tree going right through the middle of all of these the, the str millions of years strata, and then there's this tree. Trees don't live millions of years. Well, I'm not going to refute evolution here in this uh, talk this morning, but suffice to say, we have a fight on our hand. One, Islam is making its presence felt. I call it creeping Islam. Creeping Islam because little by little, they're making inroads into our Australian way of life. They've got seats in all of our universities now, professors of Islam in universities, and they've got people in uh, places in our uh, government offices as well, immigration and so forth. And then there is secular humanism. Nothing new there. Been around for over, well over 100 years now. And uh, it is destroying our uh, belief in God. Well, it was not destroying the belief of, in God of anyone here. But I tell you what, if you believe evolutionary theory, you have to toss Genesis out the window. But the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is founded on the fall of Genesis 3. So uh, we can't have both and, and you have one or the other. So we have to defend the, the, the faith. So to conclude, I just conclude with last Sunday, I wasn't here, Joan wasn't here either, because we were at our grandson's dedication, our youngest grandson, born in March this year, and he was being dedicated at uh, his church, where Stephen, our uh, son, is an elder these days. And it was a great service, great dedication, where Caleb, we're reminded means the faithfulness of God, but literally, of course, it means as the heart of God, or like the heart of God. And so he's got a lot to live up to, hasn't he, young Caleb there? As did the one in the book of Joshua and Numbers and so forth. Uh, but uh, the preacher in his sermon quoted Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit. And then a couple of days later on my desktop calendar, I turned it over to the day, to the reading for the day. It was uh, this one about spiritual maturity. We're all called in Ephesians 4 to grow up to maturity in Christ. And this is maturity. This is spiritual maturity to be more and more like Christ in our fruit of the spirits, in our love, our joy, our peace, our patience, our kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so I finish on that point by yeah, saying, yes, we need to know what truth is. We need to be those who are diligent students of the Word so that we can give an account of the hope that is within us. Otherwise, we're just dead wood in the kingdom of God. And we will be pruned off to be sure of that. So we need to be his witnesses and therefore we need to know what truth is if we're going to share it with our neighbours and friends. But that must be, that must be personalised and reined in, if you like, by the fruit of the Spirit. If we don't have the fruit of the Spirit in our witness, we will just ram truth down people's neck and uh, we'll have a big argument on our hands and don't go away convinced that Christianity is just a load of rubbish. So truth, uh, if we apply that by itself, we become legalists and we apply uh, uh, the letter of the law to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if we combine it with the fruit of the Spirit, we will all grow up and uh, we will be... Uh, we will be attractive, effective witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Help us, Lord God, to be 